Thanks, Mike. Sounds good. So we have a quorum. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, so this is the Monday, March 11th meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. Um, first thing we have to do is approve the agenda. So if I could have a planning commissioner move to approve the agenda, that would be great. So looks like Ari Armanda is raising her hand to. <laughs> I, I move go. to approve the agenda. Uh, because, right. And if you keep yourselves, here, let me go through. I can. I'll hit ask to unmute. There you go, Carlton. We and if you leave yourself there, unmuted, I think okay. you're okay. Thank you. We have a motion from Ariane. Do we have a second, Carlton? Yes, you got it. Okay, second to approve the agenda. Those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. Aye, aye. or wave your hand if you're muted. Aye. All aye. right. Agenda approved. Uh, so next we have comments from the chair. Um, I hadn't thought about it, but I guess I have things to say. For one thing, in case you weren't there at the last uh, city council meeting, we'll be going over some feedback uh, from the city council and, and we'll be taking a vote on making some changes to the proposals to the changes in zoning. Uh, it was fantastic. It, it went really well. We were concerned, uh, but the public really showed up and had our backs a lot uh, in what we're trying to do. Um, and the city council responded to that. So it went better than we could have imagined. Uh, so hooray. And I guess with that, I should say that um, since we're since we're at such a high note right now, and since I've been getting pressure to move off the planning commission, that um, I might plan to make next pressure from my work. That is not from right on anybody here. Uh, so, um, anyways. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe the next meeting will be the final one. And then, so we'll be plan. maybe you can plan to elect new chair at the uh, first meeting in April. Um, that's it for me for comments. Does anybody else have anything? I will just mention real quick, as you can see, I'm working from home today and it is very, very windy. And I know some people have lost power. So obviously, if the power goes out, we might get disconnected. And uh, I will go through and fire up my generator and get us back on because we have to have a vote tonight. So hopefully we have a quick meeting, we get a quick vote, and we make a decision and we can move on. But if not, I'll fire the, the generator and I'll get us back online. Um, so just be patient for about... 10 minutes and I'll try to get you guys all back on. So just a quick, quick warning, because we do need, we do need to have a vote to uh, approve the changes and approve the revised required report. So. That's great, Mike. Thanks for bringing that up. So nobody give up if we, if we drop. Um, Michael just be back with us shortly. Um, okay. So that's it for comments. Does anybody else have anything before we move on? All right. Uh, so the next thing on the agenda is comments from the public. So if there's anyone here from the public who would like to speak about something that's not on the agenda, that is, that's not related to the proposed zoning changes, um, now would be the time to speak up. And it looks like we have one person um, on Zoom, that's not a planning commissioner or staff. Uh, so now would be the time to use the raise hand function or wave to us or or whatever, if you want to talk about something that's not on the agenda. All right. I will move on then. So a review of the council public hearing and the zoning amendments. Um, Mike has prepared some documents for us and I can only presume that he is going to walk through it uh, with us. So with that, Mike, I'll hand it off and 
You can go for it. All right. So I think you guys should have this document. Out of my way. Uh, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger here for us. So these were all the changes that. Let's see if I can just move it over for my screen benefit a little bit. Um, these were all the changes at the start, and I sent this out to you. It's, it should be attached to the council packet that you guys all reviewed when this was a planning commission public hearing. All these went through here, and these were some decisions. In fact, 3009 on fixing stormwater rules, we said save for future. We actually ended up adding some back in at the last minute. Um, and so the gray ones are things we didn't do. And then we got down to new additions for the council to consider. So you've already proved everything above that line. This first section were changes um, that I'm not sure. The first three you guys may have seen, but came in after the public hearing was warned. So uh, we had a, a word. Just that was a technical error that had to get fixed. And I'll just run through these really quick because there's not too many of them. Um, with the density requirement, we had to add in the capital complex. We had a conversation about our proposal is if you're in the design review district, you're exempt from density. After we made that motion and we approved that and it went to city council, we recognized that there's actually an exclusion zone to the designate to the design review district and that exclusion is the capital complex so basically de density the way we wrote it density would be exempt everywhere except for the capital complex this just added capital complex back in so if you're in the capital complex you'd be exempt from density as well um and we also expanded uh commencement of development rules to include open permits um so what this exemption did was added in an extra year. So anyone who has an existing open permit, you're going to get one extra year to use your permit. And the reason why is we approved these permits during COVID and then during a flood. So there are a number of projects that didn't happen, but developers wanted to move forward on. They already got all their permits, but they didn't actually get to move forward because they got stopped by COVID and flooding. And so we put in a recommendation to extend those open permits one additional year, and then they'll follow our new rules on development permits. So hopefully that makes sense. It's just giving everybody an extra year on their permits um, if you have an open permit. Uh, then these other ones were added in based on comments from the public. So there was a comment that uh, and a gentleman reviewed the entire document and he found a bunch of stuff that were very good. So first, we have an exemption at the start of our zoning that goes through these, these. Everything needs a permit. And then we go through and say these things don't need a permit. And one of them was if you get a, if you have TV dishes or other antennas and they're less than 15 square feet, they don't need a permit. He pointed out nowadays, most of these dishes are actually closer to two and three square feet. So a 15 square foot dish is kind of, you know, so 2002. Um, so we really could lower that now. And so the council agreed and we lowered that to 3.25. Uh, we noticed a few things. We had missed a few residential 24,000s. Remember that district was eliminated as a result of the Home Act. So we are now, um, we had to, we removed it from most of the document, but we missed a couple. One was in the applicability for um, one of the planned unit developments. Uh, it was still in the legend for figure 3-11, uh, and it was still in the use table, which we ended up reusing for urban residential. He noted that um, there was a, technical piece it just just had a header that said Heinstein height 
but it didn't have anything there. And I actually ended up moving a few things around, changed the reference that was in 3.12e to move it back to the, the to move it back to 3.12e. So that's not really a change. Uh, there was a recommendation to improve the definition of top of bank, which we took his recommendation. It was out of state statute. So there is a new top of bank definition. Uh, there was a recommendation. Remember, we talked about making Country Club Road the zoning map that we said it should be Urban Center 1. It's the most flexible zoning district. It was pointed out by him and a number of other people that, well, the purpose statement for Urban Center 1 doesn't work, and a lot of the other pieces don't work. They recommended creating a new zoning district called Urban Residential. We said, okay. So we've drafted new rules for Urban Residential. It is a new zoning district. Um, and, uh, use that. And actually we put that in that area where on the use table where or a residential 24,000 used to be, we put urban residential and we put in a whole bunch of districts that we thought would be appropriate. Uh, we added urban residential to the parking exempt areas, so there's no parking requirement up there. We added it to the light zones, so now it's got some light rules. We added urban residential to outdoor seating and urban uh, outdoor display rules, just so that way it's got rules in effect. We made further revisions to the demolition to account for redevelopment projects. That's a um, he, uh, same person made a comment that our rules we're kind of focused on if you demolish something and return it to grade, but there's also a whole set of projects where you're demolishing and building on that same location. And so we adjusted the rules, made them better. It was a good set of comments, good recommendations he made. It's better product now. That was another set of changes you guys didn't see. And we can go through in detail any of these you want, but most of them aren't really making substantial policy changes, except maybe Country Club Road. Country Club Road is what kicked us into requiring the Planning Commission to review. That was a substantial change. All these other ones I would have recommended to council. These aren't substantial changes. That was a substantial change. They then had a second public hearing on February 28th. And, okay, um, I'll let you jump in, Kirby. Can you unmute or I have to unmute you again? All right. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize that was going to happen. Um, so, yeah, Mike, what, just for the for the planning commission, for whoever might be watching for the public, um, can you give us just a summary of what the country club zone is going to look like? Uh, I'm trying to remember if I'm going to be able to pull that draft. So uh, the area is still the same, except down here. Um, let me tick off the 28 changes first, and then I'll go back to talk about those specifically. And if I have to, I'll just open it, open up the, the document itself and kind of grab a few pieces. Um, so we amended on the 28th, the council amended a few uses on the table. Um, another kind of significant change, we had always talked about for density. If, um, if you have a single family home, if you have a conforming lot, you can have a duplex, even if you don't have the density requirement. So if you're in residential, 6,000 and you have a 6,500 square foot lot, you can have a duplex, even though you'd normally need 12,000 square feet, you don't because we ignore the density if you have a conforming lot and you can have a duplex. That's today's rules. Now we of course have talked about making that four units. That's in our proposal. If you have a conforming lot, you can have four units. What the council said on the 28th is, Get rid of the conforming requirement. If you have a parcel, you can have up to not four, but six units. So that's actually two changes. That's what you see here on these 28 changes. One, 
removes conforming and adds four to six. So regardless, you still have to meet all the other requirements, parking and everything else. But if, if parking is required for that area, but you, we don't look at density for anything up to six units. So that was their proposal um, they put on. That's one of the things you'll be voting on to say, yes, that's fine. Um, DPW added some revisions to stormwater rules. That's what I had mentioned above. We added some waiver requirements for signs. That was a request that had been made. Somebody had some questions on signs. They wanted to put up a, a sign that would be slightly taller than the requirement. And I said, well, we, we could have sign requirements. So that was what we did. Um, they added back the solar shading. Remember, we talked about eliminating the solar shading requirement entirely. They added it back, but only back to basically the 2021 requirement, which was we had proposed only protecting existing and permitted solar devices. So you can't shade an existing solar device, existing solar panel or hot water solar. And that analysis is now from equinox to equinox, from March to September 20th. So as opposed to December 21st, it's now the middle, and now it's only the existing and existing and permitted. So um, that's the new analysis that's in there. Um, updated table of contents. So that was the other piece. All right. So I can jump off I, the quick summary of urban residential. It allows the same height as um, urban center one. So it's 60 feet. That's five to six stories, depending on how you're doing your stories. Um, it is... Uh, does not have a density requirement, does not have a parking requirement. It is pretty flexible. I think I put setbacks at about 10 feet, so they matched more urban center too, because it didn't sound like we were looking at going for that downtown block style urban development where buildings touch buildings. Boom, 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 boom. We're probably talking about separate buildings but usually you put about a 10 foot side setback. That's what you see for, think about Main Street from the library to the roundabout. You got big bulky buildings. In this case, there'll be even bigger buildings than what you see there, but you have individual buildings as opposed to buildings touching one another. So that's kind of the difference. Um, so, and you wouldn't want them closer than 10 feet. I mean, buildings five feet apart are kind of making little alleyways between buildings. I don't think that's what we're looking for. If you're going to have a five-story building, you probably want at least 20 feet between the buildings, each building 10 feet from the property line. So that was a little bit of sense on the setbacks. So we still have really big, most of the uses are permitted. We did allow things like uh, recreation, hotels, and the, the reason for that is not because we're trying to, to have those things happen, but because we are, we really could have called this urban mixed use as opposed to urban residential, maybe being a little ticky tacky with the semantics of the names. But the idea is we didn't want to just have this residential enclave out at Country Club Road. We we're trying to think also half of the lower area is owned well it's all owned by the city half of it we plan to develop for residential half of it's going to be residential so that is going to be recreational so the recreational piece may have other uses and we may have some other uses that kind of mix in on the first floor of some of these residential buildings so some of the examples i used at the planning commission at the council meeting was we could have uh, a restaurant or a small grocery store, or um, you know, maybe we have uh, a senior facility, a senior facility that goes in there, and we want to have a physical therapy 
place or something like that. You want to allow some of these uses to be there. What you don't want to have are car washes and gas stations and those types of uses, but you do want to allow a number of uses and we own the property. So we have a lot of control, not only from this angle, but from the other angle. So um, we'll have zoning and we'll have the ability to who we approve the projects to. So, um, so that's so a little bit of the background. Yeah. Would you, would you say overall that, that urban center two is the um, best comparison for a, an existing district? I don't know if we're going to end up really having anything that looks like this. Um, I think we. I just I just I meant think, based on the uses, like based on based on the types yeah. of the types of uses happening that we would expect. Maybe it was yeah. I imagine it's going to look sounds more like a campus type style that you're describing. Um, yeah, it's going to kind of have that that look to it. Um, I think some of it. There was a little bit of, you know, chicken and egg as to do we get the developer in to find out how they would like to do it and then tailor the zoning to that, which as you know, isn't good planning, but does kind of make good sense logically that, you know, we kind of want to see where how a developer wants to go. Uh a lot of communities, if you're in Florida, they would just go through and kind of open things up in some places in Florida and you would come in and they would propose the, um, the form-based code. They would say, Hey, we're going to do a development. We're going to use form-based code. This is what it's going to look like. These are going to be the rules we're going to develop by. And basically the community agrees to the, to the code and then it gets developed and built. And, you know, if you're in Arizona and Texas and Florida and North Carolina, you'll get a lot of those. And we're kind of, sitting here figuring out, well, we'll put some zoning in that generally looks back at the process that was used to develop the Country Club Road. We're not making this up. There was a public process. Community came together. They said, we don't want single family homes. We don't want this. We don't want that, but we do want this. You know, the develop the consultant asked, how big? Do you guys want five story buildings? And they said, yes, five story buildings in the lower area is perfectly fine. So we're not just making this up. This is stuff that the public has had a process on and said, yes, we're okay with this. But five-story buildings could look like Essex Town Center, or it could look like um, Burlington, South Burlington's new town center. So you've got two completely different ways that you know the same idea could look. And sometimes you have to put some pictures out and let the public say, yeah, we like we like A better than B. And uh, some of that has to come down to letting some developers come in and say, this is what would actually work in this location. Um, we we kind of need both both hands shaking on this one to make it work. Um, so we're going to put something out. We're going to see how it goes. We're going to see what we get from the public when we do that process. And if we need to amend the zoning, we'll amend the zoning. But for now, um, it's it's opened up. For a number of uses, it's pretty flexible, but it doesn't allow everything. It's not unlimited. Thanks, Mike. Um, was Is that the extent of the changes coming back to us? Those are the changes. So some of the substantial pieces that you kind of have to go through and say, yep, we heard it and we support these changes. Um, and And... Basically, what the, the return to you guys is, if there's a substantial change, you're supposed to look at it in light of the the city plan, the master plan, and go through and say, yeah, this is still consistent with the master plan. And most of these changes we, based on, and that's in that required report that we can go over, really hung our hat on the fact that we wanted to promote housing. We a lot of this is based on the housing chapter. We need to promote housing. And so the removing of the conforming requirement, um, basically saying that non, not pro the prohibition, removal of the prohibition of non-conforming to have that benefit. The increase of four to six is just increasing housing. Um, and a number of these other pieces are really all about those types of the of changes. So the substantial changes is, is adding back the solar shading requirement. Um, 
we do have energy policies that would still support the energy policies, um, but it's now been adjusted. And even MEAC, um, the Energy Committee, reviewed the rules and said that the rules we have in place are, are ridiculous. We need to amend the rules. And they felt these rules were okay. They, they thought these these would be the rules. They, they didn't want to eliminate all of them. They would be comfortable at least protecting the ones that we have, the solar devices that we have. Because if somebody were to put $30,000, $35,000 into some solar devices to have their neighbor then build a project that shades it would be problematic. So I, I, I don't uh, think there's going to be a lot of it. Yeah, we can we can stop there, and uh, so we may as well like you know uh, have some structure to how we discuss it. So let's let's stay there for a second and discuss the solar shading. Uh, my two cents is that this is this is reasonable that this is probably not going to prohibit other things that we that we other goals we have for the city, and it's a reasonable landing place. Remember, we were coming from basically letting imaginary solar projects stop development and that that's going to be no longer the case. Um, but do, does anybody else have anything to comment about the solar recommendation? Go ahead, Aaron. I think you might need to be unmuted, Mike. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I forgot where we were. Going into the going into these latest round of recommendations, where was the solar shading? What what was on the books before this? And I and then let me just say this is like I I'm not an expert in this, but these sort of I'll call it sort of half baked approaches to what you can and can't do with respect to solar shading gives me a little bit of heartburn from a kind of litigation risk perspective. I don't know if we've had the town's attorney take a look at this and has given an opinion on it. And again, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I'm, I, I, this does give me some pause in terms of just kind of throwing out ideas about what folks can and can't do in terms of development based on existing solar facilities that may sit on roofs. I don't know what the answer to it is. I haven't looked at any of it, but I, I'm just curious if, a, what we had on the books before, because that would sort of inform what we've been comfortable with before, and B, whether or not we've had the town's attorney take a look at it. Because I think if we haven't, we might want to do that here. Because <laughs> once I just, my, my understanding is just from way back in law school is once you get into these sort of rights with, you know, light and air and all that, it gets, <clears throat> it can get very complicated very quickly. And I just wouldn't want to put, the town in a position where we're setting ourselves up for a problem that might come down the road. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to comment and then I'll let Mike go into a, a more explanation, but um, I'm right there with you about that. Do you, do you recall, like uh, this is the same battle we fought last year where the, the solar shading applied to any potential solar development. So basically anywhere. Um, and so it's dialed way, way back. The litigation risk of, of what it of the current of the of the current state is crazy high, like you're saying. So in this case, it's dialed back to just an existing device, at least, or at least or or one that's about to yeah. be installed. I was gonna say um, that that's kind of what my memory was with that, is that it, we were full bore, but I just I never knew whether or not we've had the town attorney take a look at that. Um and this just seems like something that if we want to encourage development, and especially if we start getting into multi-story development, um, given the, um, the amount of hills and trees and whatnot. And that, that was sort of, I think, the issue that was sort of problematic with this to begin with is that so much of the shading that exists, you know, is due to trees and just the topography is my understanding. I don't, you know, it those things aren't going to go away and to sort of this just to me seems somewhat arbitrary but again i don't i don't know the answer to it because i haven't run the legal traps on it by any means but um it's just something that i wanted to raise here it, ju it just seems gray at best from my perspective <laughs> yeah so to kind of 
roll back because you had a couple questions in there all at once. So the question of where where we are right now. So in our current zoning regulations, the rules are um, that you cannot shade roofs, walls, or yards, and by definition, yards in the zoning means areas within the setback area. So it really kind of shading anything on somebody else's yard. Um, and it can't shade on December 21st, which leaves the longest shadow between nine and three. So it's really early in the morning to really late in the afternoon on the, and it can't have any impact. So even you know, 20 minutes of hitting your neighbor's yard um, at 9.35 in the morning on December 21st, um, that wouldn't be allowed. You'd prohibit the development of a building. So we all know that's ridiculous, but that's what the rules say. Um, there is a certain exemption in there. There is a model that says if you don't cast a shadow bigger than 15 feet on a fence at the property line or something like that. So technically it would, you are allowed to have a certain amount of shading that would happen within that diagram and within that model. Um, it was, a, it's a, something that the consultant had put together. So anyways, that's the rule in place. Now we have proposed to city council to eliminate it altogether. What council has said is, Let's take a step back in. Let's protect at least the existing devices. Let's adjust it from March to September as the analysis. And I also forgot to mention, let's adjust that from only 10 to 2. So if you start thinking about where the sun is from 10 to 2 in those windows, you're looking at a, you know, a much more, as opposed to the sun you know, at, on December is coming across at this really low angle at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, now it's 10 o'clock in the morning and it's at the equinox. So you're talking about a much less likely that that shade is going to be causing an issue. And it is looking at mostly those rooftop things. So you'd have to be pretty high up to have that impact at that time. So I think we're just going to have to watch how this plays out over time and see how it see how the impact is but it should have a much less of an impact that that equinox line makes a big difference from the solstice. So and 10 o'clock is going to be a big difference from 9 o'clock. So both of those factors should make a big difference. Yeah, I, I, mean, uh, I understand that and I I remember, you know, John Adams in particular was pretty good at outlining why we should move away from it, which I think sort of underpins why we made the recommendation to get rid of it altogether. And I, I still think that's probably the right thing to do. I, I'm just saying it from a from a different perspective, not in yeah. terms of what's the you know what's the methodology that's used to establish you know shading. I'm just saying I I don't know if there's even a legal basis for us to, to have the this third. Rule. That was and, the and, third point. And, and if we just don't, and if we just don't know, I just am suggesting that it might be something that might be worth taking to the town uh, attorney very quickly to see if they've got a, a quick and dirty opinion on it uh, before you know when we go back to because we'll make our vote and then it goes back for another hearing at city council, right? Yep, on Wednesday. Yeah, so, so I'm, yeah, I just to me. I think you're right. If we adopt this sort of compromise position, given the equinox versus the solstice modeling, it's not, it's a low risk situation anyway, but I wonder that if even, why invite the fight if, we, if we're if we on legal, legally shaky grounds to justify in the first place. That, that's just my concern. But if it's, yep. you know, if, if, this group and ultimately city council feels like it's such a low risk situation. It's not worth getting an opinion on it. That's fine. But I, you know, just my, uh, yeah, I'm so, just a little hesitant about it. That's all. Yeah. I can, One I can check. I can check real quick to see if we could get, um, David Ruda opine on it. Um, uh, but Mike, getting Mike. to your third point, just so. Every, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead I was with just your, gonna say, 
I was just going to finish up. So the, on the third point, we did bring that up with council. It's the theory of ancient lights and really uh, what I'd mentioned to them and, and uh, that had been pointed out to me was that it is really uh, kind of a false thing. It had been something litigated many times, uh, especially during New York City with the construction of skyscrapers and people would lo be losing their, their they formerly had sunlight, now they don't. And the theory of ancient lights is basically that property owners do not own the light that crosses onto their land. It's not that, it, you know, the, if you formerly had light onto your land and somebody builds a building and now shades your land, that's you, that's not one of the rights in your bundle of sticks that yeah. you have as a property owner. Right. And that's, 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 that's a theory. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's been sort of rings a bell in my the back of my mind from a long time ago in law school. So that's, that's yeah. kind of why. I'm, I'm... So I pointed it out. And some astute counselors did some Googling and found that there are other communities that have these protections. So it's not now just because somebody in Maryland has the right doesn't necessarily mean that Vermont law being a Dillon's rule state as opposed to home rule states and blah, 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 blah. Um, so the answer is probably maybe if you ask an attorney, but I'm sure David Rue would probably have a nice long comment on it but i can see i'll talk to um bill the city manager we're trying to really be careful on spending money especially on our legal fees um but we can see um as we as you point out i think there's a certain level of risk that we're looking at from an from an appeal um i think we've always and i pointed this out to them as well i put this in a box in 2017, when we had gone to public hearing, I didn't like this rule. Others on the planning commission did. So we kind of conveniently parked it in a location where its use would show up less often. It's in um, major site plan. So only certain projects of certain scales are going to hit this. So that was kind of a little bit if we if it only shows up very infrequently we'll save ourselves some some heartburn over this it has shown up a couple times um and so we've had to address it but in general it hasn't shown up and when it, it did show up for um ewing street which kind of prompted us to go through and say okay now now it's starting to have an impact so let's have the conversation we proposed removing it everybody kind of knew we had to fix it but council wasn't ready to remove it we proposed it again to remove it, and um, here we are. So I think take half the bread loaf now and come back to the other half later. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the voter. I'm the planning director. So, but that's that's kind of how we got to where we are. Uh, but I will see if we can get some kind of legal opinion. But um, I think, unfortunately, oh. had the proposal been to put it in. I think we'd be in better shape to go through and say, I don't know if it's legally justified. We should need to get a legal opinion. It's already in. We're trying to get it out. So, Right. No, I understood. Mike, I think I think a key question just about the legality of it is how many, how, how common is it for cities to have an ordinance like this? And then if it is common, then um, that means that there's probably been challenges elsewhere. Um, in more litigious states like New York or California or something, and um, but my understanding is since it since it is something that's done like this, it, like we got it because it was borrowed from somewhere, right? We had a consultant who who took this shading idea from somewhere, right? So um, presumably, but at least I don't know. She may have made it up as she was just working with another community who wanted to do it. I don't know. I don't know where I, where she got it from. I recall being told that like it was borrowed from somewhere, but it but the version that was borrowed is obviously the most extreme restricted version of it possible, because um, it couldn't it couldn't have been any more restrictive than what it, than what the current <laughs> current one is. Um, so, anyways, the fact that it exists and that and that it's done other places at least tells me that I don't know as it it's it's stood up somewhere before, but. 
Um, so I think that would be a place to look as opposed to like getting into like really old school case law. Um, but okay. Uh, does anybody else have thoughts about this? Um, are we, uh, generally in support of, um, um, I'll get you in a second, Carlton and, and Brian. Um, are we like one question I have for the planning commission, are we generally in support of asking or suggesting that a legal opinion be sought, um, is a question that's kind of up right now. Um, uh, I think I saw Carlton first, so let's unmute him. I don't know if it's still up. Well, there you yeah. go. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm I'm just trying to glean some information uh, or the experience from Northern Power Systems when we were putting wind turbines up. And sometimes people, the neighbors would have an issue with the sh shadowing of the turbine blades. And, uh, and they were concerned about it causing epilepsy. Um, and I'm, I'm only mentioning that um, because if we build the, uh, if we present the issue to the public uh, who may not be um, paying attention to it, it will become an issue. Um, and so I just, I just want to put that out there that, um, you know, there's, we, we can, we should we should really think about uh, not signing it up in the future for the future um, because solar technology is rapidly changing um, as we speak and I would hope this wouldn't become another satellite dish uh, revise in the future. That's all. Brian. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say um, just watching the council deliberate on this. They, and we'll talk about other things. I mean, they they followed the planning commission's lead on a lot of things. Things we unexpectedly followed up and, and took them and ran with them. The four to six, and the, I mean, we were talking about other. They were talking about why don't we do all other neighborhoods, get rid of density caps in other neighborhoods? But this one um, seemed like just a bridge too far to totally get rid of it. They wouldn't go along with our recommendation on that. So it seems to me that it. I'll defer to the group on whether we get a legal opinion on it, but it does seem like a kind of a, there's no way we're going to get rid of it politically. The council is not going to get rid of it. The, the feeling around solar is too strong. So this seems like a good compromise to get, to keep this all moving. Um, oh, my thought. Anybody else on solar shading? So how do people feel uh, just like a straw poll thing? Oh, it looks like Aaron has something. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to say very quickly, I I didn't mean to put this out here to suggest like a really strong push for it. I don't know what the scope of our retainer is with Dave Rue or anything like that. So if, if, it, if it is an issue where, you know, the town manager is going to push back on spending those, that kind of money, because we, you know, that's fine. I think, I think Brian's right. It's a compromise. I I'm just cautious by nature when I this this just this this one piece just seems odd compared to the other things that we put on the table and the city council deliberated. Um, and so it's all I've always been a little uncomfortable with, it, and I was glad that we had made the recommendation to get rid of it altogether. Um, I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill, but so. Yeah, it's true. You know, this is this is one the one that we lost on last year, um, and at least we we I I saw it as like a ninety percent victory to get it down to a, like an actual reasonable place, um, but uh, it's not perfect for sure. Um, so uh, so Aaron, are you? Do you? Do you? Are you in favor of us of us doing a little straw poll to see if we want to suggest that they get a legal opinion? You may need to be unmuted again. Giving you the thumbs I'll take, up. I'll take the thumbs up as the as in favor of the straw poll. So um, those in favor uh, of asking or suggesting to have a legal opinion done on the litigation risk involved with uh, making this change as opposed to getting rid of the requirement. 
um, say I or give me a thumbs up. We'll just, just do a thumbs up if you if you're in favor of a legal opinion. I, for sure. Carlton, Aaron, anybody else? Okay. Looks like yeah, we're going to let I, it go. I just, I feel confused, <laughs> to be honest. I like what, what the value is, but um, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to it. Okay. Um, how about this? How about, Mike, if you could add something in the response that we think it's a good idea. <laughs> Not as a, like, suggestion or any kind of demand, but just, like, it, 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 could, be a, it could be something to think about for your consideration. I think Aaron has something else to say. He may need to be unmuted, Mike. Oh, why why yeah, do I seem to be the only one that needs to be unmuted every time? I feel like I feel like you're trying to but, tell me something, Mike. I uh, stopped don't, muting. Don't remute, so. don't remute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want you to. I don't want you to hear my internal commentary. Um, I think maybe another way to sort of short circuit this is, is if we just have the general vote as to whether or not we approve this change, we make that recommendation that the city council is putting forward, it would sort of short circuit the need for uh, uh, a legal opinion. Um, I mean, I would, I would only suggest getting that opinion if we felt like we weren't comfortable with the change, but if the group generally thinks it's okay, and I and I readily admit I think it's a pretty low risk scenario in terms of you know an appeal, but uh, you know if, I think if the group's okay with it generally we don't need to spend the money or time to have the attorney look at it. We generally end up with a legal opinion once somebody files for an appeal in court. So yeah, I was going to say that's, that's when the real work happens anyway. So. And then if we find out our, our attorney goes back to city council and goes through and says, you know, I've done my homework on this and my general opinion is if it goes to the judge, we're going to lose because yeah. of X, Y, Z. And then we settle out of court. So, yeah, maybe that's, or, that's... or they feel, no, our, our rules are in good shape. And, and I think we could win this based on these decisions and these other courts. And therefore we should go forward and try to win it. So, yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And if the group is comfortable with that approach, which is fine, then you know. I'm I'm comfortable with saying that you know we don't oppose the change, but uh, we would just like to note that um, it could be worthwhile seeking some legal advice about it, and that's just in the long run to save money potentially because defending it or getting a legal opinion once something's filed and doing a settlement that's all going to be more expensive. And is the policy outcome is it is it worth the potential expense? Right. So, if if you under if that was coherent enough for you, Mike, to just note for them. Yep. Um, looks like we have a member of the public interested in giving some feedback. Uh, that's fine with me. Go ahead and unmute Mike. Oh, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, I actually accidentally realized that the wave hand icon would come up, maybe motion censored in a meeting uh, a week ago, and then I forgot about it. So apologies. Um, my name is Brian Jones. I am a member of the public, but I'm also a member of the DRB. Um, and uh, I meant to participate in these meetings a little earlier. And funny story, I went down to City Hall a couple weeks ago and um, Realized that the doors were locked in the front, but open in the back. Anyway, um, I found you all tonight. And uh, I just had a very quick question about the density provision that jumped from four to six units. I realized that it's, I missed this part of the meeting, but um, 
The first question is, is this something that is still kind of open for discussion when it comes in front of city council again? Yes. Yeah, Mike saying yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so as I was looking at this in detail, I just kind of had a few questions and, and um, I'll just try to do them as one-offs here. Um, essentially, I, I, I understand the need for housing, um, but it seems like a big jump. And I guess as an architect, I should also say I'm an architect, I'm also on the DRB, also live in town. Um, I'm just wondering if density, this issue can, can or was discussed with some illustrations similar to the other diagrams that we see in the zoning code, you know, things like floor area ratio and, and, and whatnot. Um, and I also want to make it clear that I don't, I'm not trying to propose that there should be more diagrams. I, I, uh, it's not just, it's not the way zoning works. Um, it would be, it'd be too dense to have a diagram for everything. Um, but the reason I mention it is because it seems like a big increase to me. Um, and uh, the second point, which is more of a, a point than a question is, I just think maybe it's harder to go from six back to four than it is to just try four for a while and say, hey, this is a pretty darn big increase in density. Let's see what happens as a result of that. And then if, because again, my, my overarching concern is just simply that as citizens, neighbors, um, et cetera, you, folks don't really know what's coming, you know? And that's why I asked if it had been studied with diagrams. Um, and so then that kind of brings me to my third point, which is really just a question, which is, um, is it possible to illustrate this with diagrams um, of some nature and then to try to, again, see what an increase to four units minimum of any lot. And, uh, people who have discussed this at length realize this is residential 1500 as well as residential 3000, which is already a lot of times a quarter acre lot. Um, would it be worth just kind of taking it one step at a time, possibly illustrating this um, to just try to better communicate it to the public? Um, and I realize that's a little bit, there's a little bit in that question and I realize you all already discussed this. So forgive me for not being able to participate earlier. Um, the only reason I mentioned this is because I, I, I realize that we need to see a certain increase in density in town. Um, I think that could take a lot of different shapes. Um, and uh, But trying to steer away from the hypotheticals of, of what that means. I just recently studied, um, and, and Mike, I'm not, I'm speaking to everyone, but I'm going to speak to you on this point specifically. Um, I recently studied um, uh, 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 a, a development um, Pretty close to um, pretty close to my own neighborhood, and I was thinking, wow, maybe three units. This is feasible. This brings in a good amount of people. There's a good pro forma here. Wow, four units. That'd really help, right? Um, to imagine that same development with six units, it's only an apartment building, you know. Um, it's nothing else. Um, so anyway, um, I don't want to get too much into the. The what ifs, uh, I just think that it may be um, a little bit too much of an increase from, from where we are. Uh, and I think that some illustrations would help folks understand, hey, what does that house next to me that wants to add an apartment and an ADU, uh, sorry, here we go, add an apartment and an ADU look like? Mm -hmm. And they already have a current unit. Well, that's three right there. So, you know, what's that gonna look like with, Three more units. It, it, anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, so Brian, I'd like to, um, you know, representing the like policy talk as you know, as whereas Mike is uh, the technical person. I would, oh, sorry, uh, Kurt, I'll, catch, I'll, catch on, I'll catch you up on the. I'll catch you up on the like the policy place we're coming from, and we've been coming from uh, for a while now on the planning commission, uh, in looking at these things. And so overall, um, I think it's fair to say that our more or less our consensus here is that. For, for planning in general, moving away from density and using density as all as a way to regulate things is not a great idea. And uh, we think especially it's not a great idea for an urban center like Montpelier, where uh, the overall uh, policy goals for the region are to kind of concentrate development and um, 
so that so that other places are not developed so that we don't have sprawl so that we don't have you know other negative outcomes um you know uh, forest fragmentation etc uh and then, then the economic and the community and all of the like goals we have all like line up with that um so we'd like to we'd like to move away from just using density at all and we'd like to use what mike sometimes calls a form-based code which is just regulating how things look and using our design review using the you know all of the things that we have in place for determining how things look without without trying to regulate the amount of units in a place and sometimes there's going to be scenarios i'm sure like some of the things that you were mentioning where six units is not going to be probably possible on every parcel you know even though even though it's it's allowed but because of just the practicality right. of uh you know the uh the limitations on setbacks and the limitations yeah. on height and right. and things like that Sorry, um, Kirby, i'm doing this again but yeah. i'm off camera so yeah, no no you're you're good I, I appreciate your explanation and i i don't want to waste anyone's time tonight that's not um not at all my goal um i'm aware of the these other factors that you're mentioning and and i just wanted to acknowledge that so um so you knew uh, that i was thinking about this thing from um from kind of multiple sides. Uh, again, not to be too specific, not to use one case study as an example, um, but the reason I mention it is because I think it's difficult sometimes to put policies in place and everything seems abstract and there's not even an illustration or some kind of study which has been done to say, this is what could be. And that's why I brought up this example. Um, it just so happens that with a floor area ratio of 100, um, or one rather, um, on a quarter acre lot, you can have 10,000 square feet of, of built space over three to four floors. Um, if you were to look around anywhere, and I'm sorry, and by the way, that um, even with three large size units, that only equals approximately half of the floor area ratio. Um, so I want to just address a couple of things you said really quickly and then move on. Because again, my, my um, time here is not to slow anybody down, but kind of catch up. Uh, and 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 share a little bit of what I see is happening. Um, the this notion that pro density should happen downtown, I'm 100% with you on that. I think we already have a high. Um, we have no density re regulations on the downtown district, right? There was another project I was looking at with some folks a couple of years ago. It was an existing brick building. Somebody probably knows who purchased it a couple of years ago. We were thinking, hey, what about seven condos in this building? It's feasible. They wouldn't have been too small. Maybe it would have worked. Um, no, de no density regulation there. Um, so I realize there are already zones in town that have density that do not have density requirements, and I realize that taking it out may seem like an easy way to um, um, make things simplify things but but in, but i'm not sure that's how it's going to work out and i just want to point out that coming from philadelphia 10 years of professional work uh in the city uh they have density regulations as well and they're an urban environment um they also have other regulations that have to do with individuals who are or are not related to each other living in close proximity um I am pro, I'm pro development. I have a meeting with Downstreet next week to talk with the to talk with folks about some projects um, that are coming online. Uh, again, the only way that I felt like I could make this tangible to to you all uh, as a concept and also to folks in town, right, neighbors and other people who um, don't always know what's going on when it's when it's happening is just to simply illustrate something. And that's why I brought up this example of this very typical quarter acre lot, single family house, you know, in a neighborhood with primarily single family houses and four units, maybe it's gonna be condos. And I, you know, my concern is not that we shouldn't have diversity in housing and it's not that we shouldn't have um, uh, the ability for for that diversity to cater to multiple groups of folks, you know, smaller apartments that are more affordable. But there's also continuity in zoning and also in town planning, right? And this is an important thing. You have neighborhoods that have uh, families or families with uh, an apartment or even families with an apartment and their in-laws living there, right? 
Um, and and these are what we this is what we typically see in town in a lot of our residential neighborhoods. This is the fabric of Montpelier right now. And albeit, I agree that there's a lot of potential for um, increasing it and improving stuff downtown and creating higher density. It just doesn't seem like it's a good blanket um, solution for all zoning districts. And 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 um, and I and uh, getting back to my first point, and, and, which is really a question. Wouldn't it be a good idea to illustrate some of this and have it as part of the report, even if only to communicate internally within these government and these volunteer organizations that work with? Because admittedly, um, it can be very difficult to to see uh, what what change this is going to mean. And I and I, I you know, it's it's. I can uh, tell you. I can tell you one thing, Brian. That we the easiest change that we foresee. Is, is and it's and it gets at one of the biggest problems we have in Montpelier and in Vermont, and that is having one or two people in, in an enormous house, right? And making it making it possible to renovate those uh, the housing stock we have to have a lot more units in it. You know, that's that's the low hanging fruit. That's the easy thing, and that but that's also something that density can get in the way of. Um. So so that's the kind of stuff that we're expecting to happen new buildings uh in like more rural areas of the city that have six units i think that's less likely just economically and otherwise that there should be major new construction stuff i think it's going to be a, a mostly renovation stuff is what we expect to see and we've we've had land like potential developers and landlords tell us that th that they were interested in properties near the downtown area and they did not do the project because they were limited to four units. And when the, if they would have been able to do six, they would have done it. Um, so, 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 you know, valid. that's, that's really yes, what sir. we're expecting to happen. Um, but Maria also had her hand up. So I want to give her yeah. a chance. Thanks, Kirby. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that, um, point out that I live in on a street that for some reason, Brian or Mike, you might understand why, but a lot of these homes used to be single family homes, but they've been split up into six plus units. Um, I live in a single family home, but next to me, there's a building that has at least six units. And then on the other side, it might even be eight units. Um, we're on East State Street. And from the exterior, I mean, I, I've looked at historical photos of my block and the the buildings are exactly the same <laughs> as when they were single family homes. Like they're still beautiful Victorians. Um, but now we have this whole neighborhood and it's, you know, these units are filled with lovely people. You know, we're a neighborhood. We're not like, I don't know. I, I guess they're apartment buildings, but they're full of people that love living here and are happy to live here and happy to have somewhere close to town that they can walk to. Um, so I, I just don't see, I don't, I personally don't see the concern with jumping to six rather than four or even two. I mean, it's still Montpelier. It's still good people, you know, and you're giving people a place to live. So I just wanted to point that out, that this already exists on a quarter acre, quarter acre lot, and it's a perfectly nice neighborhood. Yeah. Um, thanks. I, I just had one last comment, um, partially to uh, reply to that. Thanks very much for for that. Um, yeah, I don't want to come across with any of these concerns as, as seeming kind of like uh, anti-density or something. I, I lived in Philadelphia for 10 years. Uh, I, I get it. And uh, walk, being able to walk or bike downtown is, is really um, one of the main um, kind of amenities, right, or, uh, or positives of being able to live in this town and, and kind of keep the urban fabric alive eyes on the street, et cetera. There are many, many, many benefits. Um, chopping up existing buildings that are large is absolutely, um, I absolutely understand that. My father was a, a landlord and builder and developer for many years. And there were a lot of projects where you get a big house and there would be four, maybe even five units, sometimes fewer, but I, I get it. Um, it. It's the other developments that I don't think um, maybe folks have really modeled and that's why i keep talking about these diagrams and you know uh, again floor area ratio of one ten thousand square feet of buildable space uh excuse me um 
allowable coverage in our in our ES 3000, 60%. Typical development with a lot of parking spaces and three units of some nature or a good sized house and then an, even an accessory dwelling unit, it's about 20%, 20%. So it's just one of these things, uh, folks, that from a development and planning side, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't propose to know exactly where we're going or what the solution is. Uh, my concern and, and really my ask is simply saying, should we take this one step at a time? And I realize you all have been working on this a lot, so I don't want to come across as suggesting that, um, that I know better, but as a citizen and as an architect, these are the things that, um, and I've read through all of these proposed changes too, by the way, um, I've been on the DRB now for about a year. Um, and um, it's, it's been a great experience to, to meet folks and, and understand what's going on in town and acclimate um, to the zoning code. Um, I think it might be, uh, it might be too much too soon, but I do hear you, uh, Kirby, when you say, hey, we've talked with developers and we've got these large Victorian houses and they want to chop them up. Um, it may be an apples and oranges thing. And I don't know if we can quite see that yet, where it's like chopping a building up that's already there is different um, than allowing somebody to build something new or add to a site um, and put in six new parking spaces plus six new units or five new units, get to a anywhere between a 40, 50 percent. Um, you know, it's just it's a lot. And frankly, I realize there's not a lot going on in town from a development standpoint. Uh, <laughs> as an architect, that's also very clear to me. Um, and I realize that Vermont has a housing shortage problem. And this is something that yeah. needs to be addressed. Um, Montpelier also has a tax um, revenue problem. Um, and so when we think about development, I think we also have to keep in mind scenarios for generating tax revenue, um, which is something that I'm not really prepared to expand upon. I just wanted to point out that from where we are now to one to two units, accessory dwelling unit, you know, even even the incentives that Downstreet was offering to provide middle class folks the opportunity to get some income generating revenue, increased housing. I'm all for it. I think it's a very positive policy. Um, four is a big jump already. Six, we'll see. That's I mean, I, I think I've I, I've expressed my concerns and, and frankly, um, it may just be an opportunity to. Um, to look at larger changes like this and say these are the this is the way we're going to move these forward in the future and maybe larger changes even solar is another good one where the diagrams are incredibly helpful but for folks to be able to see that visually what does this actually mean for my lot um, effect that I'm giving putting on my neighbor an effect that my neighbor might be putting on me it's incredibly helpful so when the proposed changes happen my only feedback is let's add some visuals to this to really make it easy for folks to see what what these policy changes uh, mean. You know? um, so thank you all for listening and apologies for, uh, um, you know, kind of um, just talking a little bit more than I intended to tonight. Appreciate you. Okay. Yeah, yeah we, we appreciate it. We appreciate you very much. We also appreciate the DRB very much because for one thing, uh, in a lot of towns, the planning board would be the DRB and planning commission combined. So we're just really thankful we don't have to do all the adjudicating stuff you have to do. So thank you for your service. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, <laughs> um, I also wish I, it's, I, you, you mentioned Philadelphia and I just, I'm just going to take a second to talk about that. Uh, so I, I work at the state house and I was talking to some colleagues there who are like fiscal analysts about Fishtown recently. Cause there's, you know, uh, big success. Fishtown's this, you know, really successful redevelopment area in philadelphia where a whole lot of um houses were were redone and and ended up gaining <laughs> yeah uh yeah. we were just talking about how we wish vermont had something like that but it's unfortunately it's just it is really different than the reality of a place like philadelphia like we're just almost the opposite where we just have these old victorians and things we have our housing stock just has not we don't have much of it and and so um, when you talk about the potential of people building new things, we're not seeing it. It doesn't seem fiscally possible. There's construction costs are so high. 
So like you were concerned about people throwing up six unit oh. lots on or on small lots. But we actually I agree. There aren't a lot of vacant lots in town, period. You know, and I agree with yeah. you the construction is high. So it may be an yeah. outlying kind of thing that happens, but I still see the possibility for it. And the only reason that I had these insights that I had is because it just so happened to time up that I was working on a project where, you know, this would have been very possible just like that. Right. Just, I mean, just snap the fingers and, you know, there's get, there could be a giant six unit building. Uh, but Hey, yeah, that's, it, that's it, not it, our, that's not our reality. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have a lot of developers. We don't have a lot of, people throwing a lot of money into to new developments from what we've seen. You, you said you're going to talk to Downstreet. It's like Downstreet's one of the only entities that are actually actively doing stuff, but that's because they're getting, you know, grants and they're getting the the money to put into it. We're not seeing like middle income people get, you know, have developers built for them. Um, so that's, that is a, that that's very relevant to this whole conversation is that, that we, we, we want to see um, new construction type stuff like, uh, but we're just we're just not seeing it, and and we're not. I mean, I'm not personally convinced that this making this change about density is going to make that happen at all. Just because it's feasible, like like just because it's like like you know something that can be done doesn't mean that it will be done. That's why it's it's more likely just because it's the mon the money makes sense for renovation, but I don't think the money even makes sense for new construction, unfortunately. And and Montpelier has a lot. We we have a lot of uh, obstacles in the way zoning and otherwise. So that's part of our job here too is to to try to reduce those costs as well yeah. but we we have a lot of work to do for that yeah well i i hear you and um, i'm sure you all have already thought about this this is really the only um piece that i had talked about which is yeah i mean i think everybody's excited for there to be more population in town i think when you take a building that's a certain size and you divide it up into six units instead of four um you just get six units that are less valuable than the four, right? So um, you, we're gonna get an increase in population for sure, you know? Um, and I think uh, that that could that could mean a lot of different things, but um, uh, <laughs> look folks, I appreciate you, you listening to me tonight. Um, I don't have a crystal ball and I actually don't have any, uh, any political agenda at all. I'm just a, a guy with a kid uh, who's about to go to school. And, and I think if, if uh, um, I, I love Montpelier and that's why my wife and I moved back. So uh, happy to be participating in local government and happy to be uh, meeting you all tonight and uh, appreciate your time and also your, your service. So I uh, look forward to seeing you around and frankly, in, in person, I, I, I'm going to let you all go, but is there any uh, notion of having um, meetings in uh, City Hall again? Um, I was at a city council meeting a week ago, and that was <laughs> disparate uh, public population at best. I think I was about one of three people that were in the room. Anyway, uh, Mike's shaking his head no. Uh, no, I'll, I, I can jump in on that one and say we, we're not expecting it. We don't usually get a lot, and we actually get better participation by doing remote-only meetings. So, yeah. Um, and I, I know Carlton's trying to jump in here. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Looks like he needs to unmute. Oh. Hello, Brian, you are an amazing human being for being on that, uh, doing your role over there. Um, I am also from the Philadelphia region. Uh, my father owned um, a block around Pouton Village uh, ah. in the art museum. Um, it doesn't work like that here. Um, I've lived here for 21 years. Uh, what you're stating, I appreciate it. I represent the other side of things where um, I'm looking for the density. Um, I'm also looking to alleviate the competition of um, the lack of housing uh, that the uh, landlords are able to uh, establish. Um, we're turning this uh, community into um, a community that is really loves the service industry, and but the service industry can afford to live here. 
Um, and what you're asking is doing more of the same of what's going on, and that's hiring more consultants to come up with um, paperwork or um, you know paid to convince the the public when we really all need to just sit down and have a conversation together in a colossal inclusion uh, cl uh, inclusive uh, manner uh, because. There's a lot of decisions and a lot of discussions like you're having uh, coming from a perch uh, that is not hearing a lot of people uh, that are more boots on the ground uh, than uh, represented here today. Okay, um, Colton, thank you for that. I uh, I checked your stuff out and uh, <laughs> I'm really interested in having a conversation with you in the future. I think we have a lot of shared values, but um, the whole point of, of this, I think really uh, could be distilled into my idea of participatory democracy is one where there's it's easier for folks to access what's happening around them. And as an architect, you're always working through ideas by drawing things because, and there's a famous uh, quote in architecture, why would we talk about things when we can just draw them? They don't lie. Drawings do not lie. Uh, and so I don't think anyone here is lying. I just think that some uh, um, some more diagrams, some additional diagrams for some of the uh, more important parts of the zoning code are positive, both when bigger changes happen and then also to kind of keep them in the code to make it, you know, easy for average everyday folks to wrap their minds around. If we can get a pro bono, I'm good. <laughs> you know, we, we, we can't have both ways. We can't. Oh, okay. We can't, well, we, Kirby, we, we uh, can't ask for a lawyer to check out things, and then also then you know, uh, or we can't have enough. We don't have right. enough money for a lawyer, but then we we create these, um, you know, convincing reports that may or may not fly, because right. it, and I understand what you're saying. There's plenty of information that shows uh, documentation on a, a variety of things, and it's very difficult to access. Uh, with a lot of different bumper stops. Um, it, the transparency, the ultra transparency is probably what we need to work on more than anything you're talking about right now. Yeah. All right. Well, I realize that this is branching off into all sorts of stuff, but I just want to say um, to all of you, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's, um, I feel like I've been able to express my thoughts and uh, that's not always the case with these meetings, uh, uh, as I know, because I'm usually on the other side of things. So thank you all for listening and uh, look forward to meeting you in, in person. We can talk more about uh, town and our volunteer service and, you know, how to how to um, <laughs> bring Montpelier alive, uh, to borrow from the from the uh, from the group in town doing a bunch of work. So thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for coming in. Uh... You're welcome anytime. Appreciate you. Yeah, thanks. I'll try to keep it, uh, keep the verbiage down next time, but thank <laughs> you very much. Have a good evening. Yeah, thanks for your thoughts. Uh, so while we're talking about it, we we haven't actually discussed the uh, uh, the change from four to six and the conforming and non-conforming or conforming to anything um, change. So so why don't we why don't we tackle that? Uh, do people have a thoughts that haven't been said about that change other than, I mean, I'll start off again with my opinion on it. And I feel like city council responded like lightning struck for some reason for us. And I think that this is an opportunity that put us a few years ahead. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited that, that there's interest there. Um, go ahead, Maria. Um, I was just going to echo that. I think it's, well, again, like I just said, I live between <laughs> many buildings that have many units. And I think it's wonderful, you know. Um, people just desperately need a place to live in town. And we don't want them moving, you know, to somewhere far out in Calais and then driving here every day. It's just, if they want to be in town, we should find ways to help people live in town. Um, and I don't know. I mean, maybe there's, I don't know. See, I'd even say like a risk. Like, I don't even know that it, I would be opposed to more construction, you know, outside of like the downtown area, you know, like I think this is where we want 
people to live. Um, this is where we want people. All, every kind of person, you know? So I, I agree. And I think there are, there are so many other uh, regulations in place, you know, between like demolition requirements and all of the different reviews that buildings need to go under for permitting. I think there is so much in place that would still probably um, stamp down a lot of development <laughs> that other people are afraid of. Um, so I think there's still a lot of those kinds of protections in place. But yeah, I am all for increasing increasing it to six, even though we had only voted on four. So that's my input. It's also, it's also, if I may, um, it, uh, the elephant in the room for me is I, I gleaned a lot of information um, campaigning um, and a number of people came to me and discussed, younger people uh, discussed that, um, you know, they, after they leave their parents' house and, and, and want to go to college, they can't afford to, to, to move here. They, they, uh, they can't live here. Um, even high schoolers who approached me and said, I can't vote yet, but if I would, if I were able to vote, I see the future. Um, we're stating how, you know, there, it, there's a, there's a unsaid that's going on where parents, I don't have any children and I'm old. I'm, I'm, I turned 50 last Saturday. Um, and so it's, I'm not that old, but you know what I'm saying? Um, it, there's a, there's a consensus amongst young people when they're when they trust an older person to state that they, you know their parents or grandparents are really psyched that they're going to study abroad however the unsaid is it's cheaper to study abroad than it is to be here in montpelier and studying here and one of the high schoolers suggested that i may use the idea of it's cheaper to live in montpelier france and go to school than montpelier Vermont and go to school, live and go to school. And so that's that's the issue bubbling from younger than us. This is not about us. This is not about our concerns. It's about the future. It's it, We need more housing. It's the, the population as a whole is growing. And, um, you know, to cinch the belt um, because it's stymieing tradition um, is not future focused. So I say eight, 10, however many we need, because we really, it, it's, it's long overdue. Thanks, Carlton. Uh, Brian, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, maybe. Um, I was just gonna say, so just watching it unfold at the council, we were all, you guys had prepared me that we had to be really incremental and tread lightly because of politics, which I think was probably good counsel based on the experience you guys have had. But, and we brought it up to four because that's consistent with the state law that just passed, right? So, and then spurred on by citizens chiming in at the council session and the council members themselves, they said, you know, let's be a little more bold. And many people have mentioned the big changes that went, zone changes that happened in 2018 and that there hasn't been, I, I think it was Nathan or someone else at the council saying, well, it really hasn't been much development since those big changes. Yeah, there were changes. There were some changes for the good and there's some real positives, but we're just going to have to be more bold, just be bolder and less incremental with it. So I, I'm on, I'm, and I, I don't look a gift horse in the mouth. If the council politically is ready to go to six, let's, let's go. I'm with it. Honestly, I think it's incremental too, though. I mean, the six things incremental. I think I think the the long run is the, is to not have density requirements so that we can focus our zoning attention on specific things that that really matter, like design review and you know other things like that. Things that people do care about and and um, you know not not just limiting the amount of people who can live here, uh, which is what density is the entire point. Density. Um, so. I still incremental, I think. I think six is. Uh, I think four would have maybe caused some projects maybe to happen that wouldn't have. It would have just been a handful, maybe less. And I think six is going to be maybe a handful more and still not going to be any kind of silver bullet. Um, it's just like Nathan said, like everyone has who's been around here looking at the state of things for a while knows we were way behind. The catching up we did when we redid the zoning when I first joined was um, basically making it so that the town as it exists was legal 
but not even not even 100 percent. it was up to 90 percent. we brought everything up to 90 percent. i mean that meant that the zoning that we were starting from before that was so anti-development that it made the town as it exists illegal um so and, and we still only brought up to 90 percent like when we when we did all those changes so we still made 10 percent of our beautiful neighborhoods that everyone loves like the meadows and stuff like a lot of that, a lot of those houses that everyone loves and cherishes is still non-conforming. As in, we don't, you know, according to our zoning, we don't want that, which we obviously do. So anyway, a lot, lot farther to go. Um, so thank you, Kirby, six, for saying that. Six isn't a huge step, really, considering how far behind we are and how long Montpelier spent decades um, being pretty anti-development. And it's why we have a crisis, obviously. The crisis didn't happen overnight. It happened after decades of preventing housing. Um, so anyways, I'll get off that soapbox. Uh, <laughs> everyone's good with three. Everyone's good with the three and everyone's good with that change. Are there any other uh, of these changes that people would like to discuss then before we go to a vote? It is seven, so I'll, I'll start moving things along for for us. Anybody have anything else? Everyone's good with the, um, Mike did prepare the memo. We didn't formally go through it. He sent it to us though. That's gonna be part of our response back. So just yeah, wanna make sure a legal, There's a legal requirement. You have to do a required report. Planner busy work, it's a big BS form, but I won't get on my soapbox because you don't need to listen to me, um, but uh, yeah, we're required to do this very specifically written out report. And so when this comes back, we've got to amend the required report. So I amended the required report. I believe I highlighted the section that I changed, but there isn't too much that had to technically change. But officially, you'll have to say these are okay. And here's the amended required report. Um, so, so is everyone good with that, with the report, with the, uh, the caveat being my, um, with, with the one, with the one, you know, note about shading that we'd like to pass on. Um, so. Yep. PC thinks it's a good idea to get a legal opinion on solar shading provisions. That sounds great. So is, uh, do we have a motion to approve, uh, the report with that one amendment? Motion from Brian. Uh, do we have a second? Yeah, at least get us all on the screen here. Uh, Aaron's got a thumbs up. Aaron. So we'll, we'll uh, so a motion from Brian and uh, a second from Aaron. Uh, does anyone want to discuss the report or the changes before we vote? Um, can, I, can I just can I ask when it states uh, in materials uh, who determines the high quality in the section of materials? Specifically, material? what? So it's uh, so let me let me bring it up for you. Um, let's see here within so in within the document of. Let's see, I do have it here. Is here it is. All right. Well, this is you. Uh, can you go to materials? Um, is it in this document here? It would be yes. Uh, no. Okay. No. It's in, this document. it's in the larger document, the 171 page document. Are we reviewing that at all? Oh, you mean the the full zoning bylaw? Yeah. Document. Do we have anything to do with this or? Oh, I mean, that's, I can. I can pull that one up. That's the entire bylaws. Okay. I'm just looking for the materials aspect of it. Um, when it when it states, it 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 it's very specific about different things. Um, and I'm just trying to I'm I'm trying to understand who determines the high quality in the verbiage, um, because you know, it that's subject to opinion.
Just give me one moment. Okay. If you've got a, a either a section reference or a page reference, then let me bring it here. Okay, so it would be. Oh, I have a question about the signs too. Um, let me bring it just one moment. It's the material section. Sorry. I. Uh... No, it's a big document. <laughs> Big document. Oh wait, I'm going the wrong way. I got to go to 171. It's page 171. Hold on a second. There it is. Okay, so I have a note. Actually, no, no, no. You messed me up. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, it's all right. Um, so first, I, I'm. Okay, so there's there's in part three. I have a number of things circled uh, in part three um, of, and so that starts at 132 of 220, uh, 212 um, under five, uh, section five, it says under waivers, uh, the development, uh, development review board may waive the amount and placement standards where an applicant demonstrates that the, that way uh, the waiver request creates the minimum variance uh, from the standard and, e and either and I'm I'm looking at um, B. I'm not sure if you're there yet because I'm kind of in the wilderness as far as the what, what was the section number again? It was section number. Oh, you want the part or you want the section? Because this is I, I I don't see a word as section. I see the section or the page. It there'll be a page three dash fourteen or something like that or a uh, section number. I see. Okay, I'm looking at it more from my. Um, Okay, so it's section three dash six three. I'm blinding everybody as I go spinning through here. Sixty one, sixty two, and sixty three. So I'm in. Chapter 320, Site Plan Standards. So is that page 132 for you? Uh, 141. No, I'm, so I'm, I'm in. There should be like a section number on the left side. And it's 3-2. What are the numbers on the left side, Carlton? Is there is it like a three one two four or is it like like a four digit number on the left side? Three two zero oh, three. Um, okay, yeah, that'll get us there. Okay, cool. All right, three two zero oh, three landscape and screening requirements. Right. Right. So as far as um, okay, I have a number of things in this section. Okay, so the building. It, one is this the building mount equipment um when when it says the wall uh the wall mount equipment I, and first of all let me let me ask before i even go into this do we have any type of say in this oh yeah you guys officially write this i mean technically i wrote so, it and so, the consultant wrote it and you guys reviewed it and approved <laughs> it or a previous version of you guys did yeah i was going to say i have nothing to do with this okay um <laughs> the I, I'm I'm so I, so the future is so important, and uh, some of this wording for me, I, given that I'm always looking for um, creative ways of development uh, that will cut costs, uh, also be sourced locally uh, to to save on transportation. Um, it, the rooftop equipment uh, utilities shall be enclosed or screened by the building's walls or the parapets that parapets, uh, that shall be compatible with the form design and materials of the building. Um, 
so walking around Montpelier and and kind of trying to find this example, it it it, it does this require um, air conditioners or HVAC equipment? Is this what is this talking about that aspect of things? I'm I'm not sure the building mount equipment. What is that? Is that the utilities? Is it the solar panels as well? Uh, no, it wouldn't apply to the to the solar panels. Uh, it apply. It would have those have special special rules. It applies to most of those HVAC systems. So usually, if it's a roof mounted piece of equipment, usually what'll end up happening is it ends up getting um, set in a little bit to the center of the building, so it can't be viewed, or you end up extending the walls of the parapet at the top, so the roof is slightly below, so that way it helps to to screen rooftop uh, equipment. Uh, and then the wall mounted, usually, especially these, these get approved all the time, even in design review. So usually you're trying to locate them around the corner. You're going to put them in um, a, a colors that, you know, we don't want somebody going, putting in a, you know, a compressor for a district heat sit or for a, um, for a, air source heat system to go and have them fluorescent yellow or something like that. Um, you know, we're going to want them to be colored and muted and put into a location where they're less visible. Uh, those types of, those types of requirements, put them on the side of the building or on the back of the building, not on the front of the building. Okay. All right. Let, I, I just want to touch on a couple of them because this is a this is a large document. Um, just some things that I just circled that caught my eye. And now regarding the the uh, materials in Section 3207, the design and cap, uh, uh, compatibility. Uh, and that would be uh, so the material section number four, uh, when it states that's my that was my original reason for coming to this document. It's the use uh, uh, a is use high quality building materials, use a complementary palette of materials on all sides of buildings, have materials change, uh, changes located at interior corners or other logical terminations and not at the external. So I understand what you're saying as far as some of the equipment, um, but what does that mean as use high quality and who sets that standard as far as uh, determining the high quality building uh, materials? Ah, there so we guys, go. We're, high we're quality building materials. Yes. Um, can I can I intervene for a second? Uh, we're we're actually going to running out of time. This is a very important vote, so I think we should get the vote done, and then um, I would suggest like Carlton and Mike doing like going over this offline. Maybe, um, is that okay? Uh, that's up to up to Carlton. I'm fine to always sit down with any planning commissioner who wants to go over these these is questions that, that here. Okay? Yeah, is that okay, Carlton? If Mike and you go, and you guys can even take a deeper dive because we're gonna we're gonna run out of time in like ten minutes anyway. Yeah. Um, and Aaron, did you have something before we finish the vote? Yeah, I was just gonna ask what agenda item this is relevant to. Yeah. It's not, it's so I sure. think we should just going, not just not have this discussion right now. I'm not saying that it's not important, but it's just we've got to get through the agenda items. So let's focus on that and get the vote done. Yes, it seems like it seems like a good thing to 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 tackle offline, and then and then you'll have more time. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna proceed with we're gonna proceed with the vote. And uh, did anyone else have any more discussion of the motion? The motion was um, from Brian with a second from Aaron to approve the report that Mike prepared for us with the addition of a note concerning sh uh, solar shading and a legal opinion. Um, any other discussion of that before we vote? Is there time? Okay. Huh? Is there time? Yeah, there's definitely time to vote if we're good. Um, I was just checking in to see if anybody had any more discussion. So uh, let's do it. Uh, those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Or, or do a wave or thumbs up, any indication. Um, okay. 
and Ariane. Okay. Uh, and any opposed? Do a frowny face emote or something. Uh, and then uh, any abstentions? Do a shrug. I don't know. Okay. Looks like it was unanimous. So we have six people here. Yep. Six zero zero, Mike. Okay. We've approved the report. Hopefully the city council follows up with all of it. Um, I will probably be at the meeting on Wednesday to monitor. So far, I've it will be late. It'll be Anyone late. Who's by got the, the patience? Yeah. Uh, so we're we're on the agenda after council orientation. My, I've I've been doing this for ten years now. Council orientation usually takes about two hours. So, how many? If we're on after it? after the eight thirty break, I would be surprised if it's that quick at eight thirty. May not be till later. How many new people are there, Mike? There's just one, but we had a number of new people last year as well. So as Bill likes to point out, the first time you give these guys, you're giving them just a waterfall of information. Mm -hmm. And then they sit on the council for a year and you give them that same presentation and they're like, oh, I get it now. I get that. I get that now. I get that now. I get that now. That's something I don't even remember from last time. So it. they it's, they do it every year just because every year somebody learns something new that was in the last presentation. But um, I did not actually follow up to learn uh, who won the – it was District 1, right? Who won the District 1 seat? Uh, Adrian Gill uh, replaces okay. uh, Donna um, Bate. So okay. Donna was the most senior member of the council. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but I do believe um, there were two people who were new last year, um, Tim Heaney and um, actually there may have been three new people last year. So there are a couple of folks that are getting their second orientation and one person getting their first orientation. Hmm. Okay. All right. Does anybody have anything else? Um, I think we'll just save the the minutes um, and go ahead and adjourn unless we have anything else before. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to adjourn without a vote. Have a good night. Thank you all.